Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insight. Thanks, sponsors, Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication, ComC.com, Burbank Sports Cards, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Heritage Auctions, Hugs and Scott Auctions, and Panini, Upper Deck, and Tops. Patrick, Ryan, and I discussed many things, but this segment was facing plateaus and how the hobby does not march forward in lockstep, one step at a time. Sometimes it's two steps forward, one step back. Sometimes, as in some of the circumstances we're talking about, the hobby takes three steps forward and the hobby's not ready for it, or the industry, if you prefer. And then there's some lack of initial acceptance, but then sometimes that can be just a great opportunity for those who are believing in these new products right from the start. When Everybody says, ah, that's too high. Be careful what you say, because when you fast forward a few years, sometimes what was so terrific but perceived as overpriced becomes a very scarce, valuable, and beautiful collectible. So Patrick has a great eye. He also, as you've heard, has made this adjustment of still loving new stuff, but understanding that he wants to have balance and be in the old stuff as well. So again, I really enjoyed that perspective of being balanced of not just vintage and not just brand new, but really of having some understanding of both. Again, worth listening to. I would like to listen to it. I enjoyed it. And so I hope you do too. So here's Patrick and uh, our discussion. In the mid 1990s, we saw a lot of innovation around inserts and premium brands. What was your reaction to Top's Finest when it came out into the market? Everything that came out that set a new pricing plateau was met with resistance. And so a lot of people said no, and the people couldn't figure out or perhaps even recognize the refractors, which is really what drove the product. But not everybody figured that out originally. There were people that would trade in their Griffey refractor for another box, not understanding that's the best thing that's they could right. have gotten out of any box or a bunch of boxes. Then you had the PMGs and things like that. As you get past 95, 96, 97, 98, they were like too rare to price almost. Yeah. We had to do multiples because when somebody got them, they either didn't know what they were or they set them aside. When you look at the pop reports, not very many of them have been graded. Okay, where are they? They're not in unopened product that's sitting in warehouses. They're probably in landfills. Yeah. Destroyed. But some number of them are in collections. But if they really were in collections of savvy people, there'd be a number of them saying, the price is right and the price is ripe. It's time to sell. Now it is. Hype. And yet maybe they're thinking, gee, it's going to go up even more. I remember with the PMGs, almost not being disgusted, but being like, this is silly. I don't want an all green card or an all red card. I want to see the background. So I can definitely yeah. see how they got tossed. Well, buried in a box of commons. But still, if they were buried in a box of commons or they're in somebody's collection, right. they would have surfaced by now unless they went to the dumpster. Yeah. I think a bunch of them yeah. had to go to the dumpster because you have the residual effects of the junk wax era were that cards aren't worth very much. And that's sad. Again, this is probably part of your original thinking aspect is that pop reports don't tell the whole story. Oh. Serial numbers don't even tell the whole story. Especially, well, with the FLIR bankruptcy, the ultra platinum medallions are a nightmare. And I've gotten caught up trying to figure that out because I do think the platinum ultra medallions are somewhat undervalued relative to PMGs, but a lot got backdoored. So it's very problematic. All right. So if I'm not knowing that, Patrick, it's why you're at the mercy of whatever the person is. Let's call it marketing instead of hyping. But... People hype and market what they have. And if they get one, then it's great, and they want to sell it to you for a premium price. But if you have historical perspective, you say a year or two ago, that was a lot less money. And the other comparable things, and like I said, you have a certain amount of dollars in your wallet, and you think, I'm going to spend it on something, and it's not going to be that, because I want to get something that's a good deal. Or if I'm going to overpay, it's going to be something I'm so excited about. It's like a house. Very similar to real estate comps. I'm overpaying for this house. Because I love it. It's really going to fit my family. The whole narrative of it, it's a one of a kind. Totally. And to that point, we talk about education, why it's so important is you should not be buying platinum ultra medallions. If you don't know there was a FLIR bankruptcy. It's also funny to look back upon when FLIR and Marvel were one company. They didn't realize how much IP they owned. Oh. I remember that stock being at two bucks before it just dissolved. You talk about pricing plateaus and every kind of product coming out to achieve a new plateau. 2003 Exquisite was so fascinating is the hobby was in a very sleepy period when that came out. So a lot of people were like... It was an outrageous product. Yes. Outrageous. (laughs) And it was so outrageous, so far beyond the imagination even 
of the average collector that it, it was laughable. Yes. I think. Did you open or review any of it? We'd get samples from the companies. And the more expensive it was, the less we got. But we'd have to have something to show. Oh, yeah. And we'd go out and buy stuff for our card library. We tried to have samples of things so we could at least show. Most of the cards pictured in the magazine were cards right. that we had. Got it. Another. So what would you say the trajectory of Exquisite was? It started off as absurd and now it's iconic. What's the story? How would you define the journey of Exquisite from when you first heard about it to where it is today? It's Were you not shocked? a steady upward climb. No, I'm not shocked. Because now, in hindsight, Patrick, that's the thing. You look back, you think, why didn't I jump on that? And the reason nobody jumped on it because they thought it was multiple hundred percent overpriced for what a piece of cardboard should have because they weren't looking at it in the way it's looked at now. Just like baseball players, football, basketball, hockey players, the older players, the hindsight you're evaluating based on today's new rules of the game, new rules of the way we look at things. And that's the same thing now. Now there's even more premium products that say, wow, that wasn't so bad. Why didn't I jump on that? It's because at the time it was unprecedented. That's these player salaries. They just keep going. And Will going. we ever think that some of these were bargains? Right. In my company, I didn't have multi-year contracts. With them, so I had some superstars. <laughs> right. You probably have some superstars yes. in your company. Yes. And you'd love to lock them in, but it doesn't even work. It doesn't even work. Unless you have an antitrust exemption monopoly and you're not going to get it in your business. No. I never felt like we had a monopoly, but we had a pretty high market share. Yeah. And yet we had competitors and imitators, and you probably do too. Yeah, of course. It's part of it. It's good to make sure you stay differentiated. What was the transition like when eBay started growing? You said, okay, we're going to have to transition to more of an online platform. We were online very early, doing auctions before eBay was, even digital online kinds of auctions. But it's my mistake. I never doubled down to say, hey, that's the future. I need to bet the farm. I said, I got a cash cow that quit being quite a cash cow not that long after that, but it's hard to cannibalize your own business. We were having ongoing discussions with Amazon, with eBay with Yahoo and whoever else. Yahoo's marketplace was big. It was big at the time. Yeah. We really went down the road of potential partnerships or acquisitions and things like that. And again, my mistake was I was unwilling to uncouple the digital from the physical. Got it. Amazon would have bought the digital stuff probably for more than what the whole company was worth. But I was a purist and I thought, I don't see how I can maintain creative control mm. if I have a huge partner that's controlling the digital aspect, even though they could have promoted it a thousand times than we could have. And again, that wasn't the Amazon of today, but it was the Amazon of 20 something years ago. Basically a half of a Wagner. I came in the second highest bidder at about 500 grand. Do you think I made a mistake not getting that half a Wagner? I think there is a false sense of security that no Wagner in the same condition has ever sold for less. It's been March upward. There's always the possibility. It doesn't go on forever. It could, but you shouldn't bank on it. You can bet on it, but realize it's a bet. So that half Wagner, conventional wisdom from past history would say, whatever you would have paid, you could have sold it for 10 or 20% more a year, two or three later. And anything pre-COVID now, that's another thing that's right. unprecedented. You make a mistake right now, it looks like you made a mistake. Any Wagner you could have bought, you should have bought. That's I true. was the underbidder at a five figure price from back 45 years ago. So the reason I so wanted it. the big idiot in the room? It's <laughs> me, Patrick. We all had a time machine. But for me, it would have been like, it's in my Mount Rushmore, the Wagner is. What's your Mount Rushmore? I don't really have that. That's why I have a thousand cars. I really think it's my personality from doing all the price guides and the almanacs. It's always about the long tail. I really have an appreciation for the whole hobby. I see that this concentration on only a hundred cards, nothing against yeah. you. That's the way most people look at it. Yeah. The hobby is not healthy if every card oh, can't yeah, find yeah, a yeah. home. Yeah. So a part of my dollar box at the card shows is to show that 
all cards can have meaning. You don't yes. think I'm no good if my best card is a hundred bucks. Yeah. If your best card is a hundred bucks, that's terrific. It doesn't have to be a million dollar card or a hundred thousand dollar card. Well, and also I think people can have the cards where they're like, I just love the photo or I yeah, love the colors. Perhaps, yeah, you, you, yeah. you can build. But it doesn't have to be extreme value. Yeah. I mean, it has to have a story. And if the only part of the story is what its value is, that gets a little stale. The Topps Now product, which I like because it's got dates on it. What do you think about Topps? It's a contrived collectible. That's the only problem is got if it. it's print and demand. Hmm. And that's an instant collectible instead of something that is stood the test of time or a lot of the collectibles that are the most valuable, like you mentioned, seal video games or VHS, things like that. They're valuable now because they weren't intended. You don't right. expect to see them now in that condition. Tops now, nothing against them, but they're there for now. Okay, In 20 years, people won't probably throw them away because they intentionally bought them instead of this accidentally stumbled onto something. Yep. And that's part of the charm of collecting is that there are people that had stuff from their dad and they bring it out. And if it's really in great condition, that's amazing. What I like about Tops now is the fact that they generally sell for less than their MSRP price or their at launch price. Like the autos and whatnot, they generally on the secondary market trade below what they launched for. Now, there are some exceptions to that. What I find fascinating is that it still has a very diehard group of collectors around. Now, what I also say is if people PC a player, I think they got to look at some of the top stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Cards. No, I think that's totally legit. Yeah. And some of the things they've done when it's an unpopular player, a player with no following, at least in the ones where they print a demand, and right. the, print, the demand goes way down, and the value can go up because they didn't print very many. But ultimately, every card needs to find a home. And for most cards, that's not an investor. That's somebody that says, I want that player, I want that card, I collect cards from that company or that year. Otherwise, if their hobby moves too far up market into more of these expensive boxes that just have one pack and uh, four cards in it, that have to be four great cards and the potential for something really great, nothing wrong, that's part of the market. But if that's the focal point of the market, right. I don't not I don't sustainable. Think that's good. We talk about print on demand. It echoes back to the days of ETOPS. Yeah. What did you think about ETOPS and did you ever collect any ETOPS? Well, I have a few. They'd send us some just to get acquainted with it. But if any of these alternative kinds of distribution methods, I'm more of a purist. I think things ought to be in packs, that there's a randomization element that's fun to open up and see what you get. And some of these other print on demand and Panini Instant. It's a free world, right. and I admire their creativity, but if it's very successful, that means they sold a lot. Good? Yeah. If it's not successful, they lost money. Is that good? No. So I don't want cards to be everywhere in the fullest sense of capital E everywhere. I want them to be everywhere they need to be, Yeah. which is more accessible than they were, but not omnipresent like they were 30 years ago. So retail versus hobby. Do you remember when that first started happening, the segmentation of product by retail and hobby? In fact, retail was first. For tops, there weren't hobby shops. When there were hobby shops, and then there was some distinction of different product configurations. Like jumbos. Yeah, all that stuff they do for the different retailers. But And I think that there's nothing wrong with that. Again, as you've parlayed, the knowledge to know not just where the product is distributed, but the configuration or what's in that. To know I've got a better bet of getting something good out of this hobby product than the retail product. Yeah. Because it's more loaded or it has the chance for certain things. Sometimes it can be the other way around. Yeah. As a purist, I want the hobby to get the better deal. Yeah. I'm with you. I also think back of Pinnacle, the Skyline set. It was only in one configuration. Then I think 9293 Fleer, maybe the Rookie Sensations, the first ever Rookie Sensations are only in one type of configuration. To me, that's the jumbos, sort of, I think. The jumbos, yeah, yeah coincidentally. Yeah, that's not a hard and fast rule, but a lot of those earlier retail only inserts are tougher than you would think. Yeah. Because retail was less saved, less held on to. Once it got in the card shop and got into the knowledgeable card flow, if it was a hobby pack, those are there. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Some of the retail inserts from the 90s are very tough. Yeah. And fun and beyond what their insertion odds would suggest. The man in the house. 